The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they've laid him. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They've taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they've laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to the others and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The Gospel of the Lord. These are dangerous memories that you and I are sharing tonight, recovering the stories about the preaching ministry of women. What do I mean by dangerous? I think it's something like when I drink champagne. It must be the bubbles. The first couple of sips, I, I, I sort of half close my eyes and I say, I feel dangerous. Like I might slip outside the box and do something very unlike me. I don't know, I might just smoke a cigarette or... Speak my mind without a filter, (laughs) or dance like nobody's watching. Dusting off these memories of our mothers in faith, of Miriam, of Elizabeth, of the Samaritan woman, of Mary of Magdala, it's that kind of dangerous. They might just propel us out from our proper places as women and men in the church. Pray, pay, obey. They might move us from there to say something honest, maybe something about our hurts or how we've been healed. Maybe to actually bless someone that the church says is not worth blessing. Or maybe to give a voice to our wildest hopes of how this church, this country, this planet might look. This go and tell stuff is risky business. And for another reason, too. I mean, who is really listening 
anymore. We, we, we cannot take it all in, the 1,000 channels on television, or there's newspapers and magazines that I throw into the recycling bin never having opened. I mean, honestly, and do you trust everything you hear? Um, the truthfulness of the speaker, the reliability of the word, uh, does she really mean what she's saying? And how often do we ask ourselves that? The overwhelming number of words that are out there, it makes us very suspicious of language, I think. I think it all started when we experienced that great disconnect. It was the taste in our mouth when we bit into a tomato that the sign in the grocery store said was vine ripened. I think that's when it all started. Is there a word we can really trust? And when the message is coming from someone representing God, the stakes are even higher. The authority of the preacher to fill in that gap of silence between God and us, that is powerful authority. And the risk of letdown is enormous. We sit there and we mentally beg the preacher, please, try to say what you believe is true. Try to say it from the heart and then sit down and let the conversation between God and the assembly take off from there. Right? So we're in a critical time, I think, and in this critical time, we find ourselves here celebrating the feast of the one who was the first to preach the good news of Christ's rising. And we can ask, is anyone listening? And how do we know what we're hearing is true? What can we learn from sharing dangerous memories of women's preaching? I think the four stories that we heard from the scripture have something to say to us. There's an authority that each of these women exhibit. Miriam, Elizabeth, the Samaritan woman, Mary of Magdala. And their authority is unique to each one. They're different. But each one might be a model for us. Not one of them was sanctioned by any religious leader to preach. But each one goes and tells good news. Powerfully, uniquely. So let's just look at them again. Imagine Miriam at the seashore. Before the tambourines and the shouts of victory and joy, imagine she's standing there with that ragtag bunch of refugees, looking at the sea and watching. And they catch their breath and watch with dawning awareness as the waters close over the Egyptians their chariots, and their charioteers. And what does she do? Miriam, I think, takes all that she's experienced, all that she has seen, and takes it all in to herself. And then she takes the next step in that complex in that troubled road to freedom. And she leads the people across that threshold from oppression into freedom and into a new existence as God's own people. In the next story, we see Mary and Elizabeth meeting at a literal threshold 
at the doorway to a home. And aren't both of them in a liminal space? They're both at a threshold. As one way of life is ended, but what's next is not yet known. That space, you know, between letting go of one trapeze bar and before grabbing on to the next. That space. You know it. It's an uncomfortable place. It can be a tension-filled space, but a necessary place for us. And what better to find at that place, at that edge of knowing, what better to find than a friend, a wise friend, who more than uh, accepts us, who blesses us at that place. Next, we see the Samaritan woman who names what has happened to her. Come and see a man who told me everything I've ever done. The only authority she possesses is her experience. And for a marginal woman, for any of us, that's authority enough to give testimony. And in John's telling of the resurrection story, first she speaks out of her confusion and then she speaks out of her grief. Mary of Magdala turns from the tomb and turns toward the voice who calls her by name. And from that encounter she goes and demonstrates extraordinary leadership. Rooted in love, secure in her love of Jesus Christ and his love for her. She doesn't argue with the others. She doesn't fight or threaten the rest. She just leads. She goes and tells the good news, the news upon which the church is built. When the new worship space at the Church of the Resurrection was built, we included an image of the women of the resurrection. If you haven't seen that in life, in real life, or in pictures, I have some postcards I can show you afterwards. The artist named this marble sculpture, this life-size marble sculpture, Witness. Sometimes we call it the Three Marys. All of them are witnessing the good news. Each of them uniquely, no one the same. The Three Marys might also be wonderful role models for us who must give witness. We must give witness to good news today. On the right hand of the sculpture is Mary of Nazareth, who's receiving the news of her son's rising from the dead. And in the center is Mary of Magdala in the act of proclamation. And the figure on the left we call the other Mary. After Matthew's telling of the resurrection story where two women go to the tomb on the first day of the week, Mary of Magdala and the other Mary. The other Mary in this sculpture is the friend, the friend. And in the sculpture, she places her hand on the shoulder of Mary of Magdala in support. In their own ways, each of these women in this sculpture gives witness to the good news. So what does it mean to go and tell? I think our companions in scripture and in the sculpture, and our companions in the flesh, and those who've gone before us in the spirit have a lot to teach us about our own responsibility and our own giftedness for this commission. We can do this. They tell us we can sing, we can dance, 
Start a conversation. Stand at the threshold as a good companion. Offer a blessing. Give testimony. Name what happened to us. And some might ask, can I really say that? Can I really say that? If I believe it, but it's not in the catechism? Or if I'm just a lay person in the pew? Can I really say that? And these women say, yes. Yes. This is right where your word belongs. Somewhere between the question and the answer, between one trapeze bar and the next. This is where your word belongs. Anna Carter Florence is a teacher of preaching. She wrote, preaching is not a right or privilege reserved for those who locate themselves at the power center. Preaching, she says, is the slow work of standing in your own life and in the word of God and saying what you see and believe, no matter the consequences. It might feel dangerous. We might feel afraid no one will listen, no one will believe. But when each word is offered in love and truth, there is an authority that no one can dispute. So go and tell. Preach on, sisters and brothers.